Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. Camp Lejeune toxic expert Mike Partain discusses his experience as a breast cancer survivor exposed to toxic chemicals as a baby on Lejeune and his service as a Lejeune advocate. As far as the camp goes, um, you know, like I said, I joined the camp actually. uh, My first meeting was December of 2007. The camp was incepted, I believe, in 2006, and there was an expert panel in 2005. So it had just really gotten started when I got got involved. Um, you know, after I was diagnosed, I talked to Jerry on the phone, and for like four months while I was going through chemotherapy, we were going back and forth and talking about documents. And and um, you know, he knew my background as a teacher and history major, and he he was giving me some of these documents, and I was analyzing them and basically producing little reports to him of what I thought. And um, he and Danita worked to um, to get me seated on the cap. And um, what happened was there was a resignation in protest, uh, uh, some other people that weren't being effective, uh, to put it point blank, um, more showboating, but they, they left and it created an opportunity for me to take a seat on the cap, which I was offered and took. One thing about the cap before we get into all the other stuff, I will say this, without the cap and what the cap is, um, it stands for Community Assistance Panel. We're a a community panel. There were representatives from the Marine um, Marine Corps that were on there at one time. There were scientists like Dr. Clapp, uh, Dr. Cantor, Dr. Blossom, who provided um, at no charge to the government or to the community, they provided their epidemiological um, ed, you know, knowledge. And then, uh, like I said, members of the affected community, such as myself, yourself, Lori, and, uh, and Jerry. The, the big thing about the CAP that people don't understand and don't realize is that for the, what, 17 years that the CAP was in existence, because it's still there, um, that provided a voice to the community that uh, we would not have had. It provided a voice to interact with the government. Now we couldn't object, we couldn't say anything. When I say object, we couldn't block, like if we didn't agree with what the government was doing, which we didn't in a lot of ways, uh, we couldn't make them do anything. All we could do is raise our concerns, raise questions, provide evidence, and and have a discourse, not not showboating, you know, like showboating stuff like taking contaminated bottles of water and putting on a desk or anything like that. We had to fight this through words and through being there and holding people accountable. Um, so the, the cap gave us that venue and it's a critical venue because without it, the community wouldn't have had a voice that we could uh, go back on. And one of the beauties of the cap for those that are watching this, if you Google um, ATSDR, which stands for the Agency of Toxic Substances Disease Registry, community assistance panel and go to that site, there's an actual transcript to every single meeting that we have held uh, from 2006 to the present. And those transcripts are all court recorded. Now, of course, with the pandemic, we don't, we haven't met in person since 2000, I think December, 2019 or so, but um, every, all these meetings are court recorded. So when the government says something, it's right there in writing. If we say something, if we bring up evidence, it's right there in writing. And there have been plenty of times that we've gone back to these cap transcripts and gone to Congress and said, look, Senator uh, Burr, Senator Hagan, Senator Nelson, you know, this is what the Department of the Navy said. This is what the scientists said. Um, You know, here it is in black and white. And that gave us the ability to kind of nail jello to the wall, which is uh, one of the, the ways I describe the fight that we've been in is trying to get, you know, if you haven't tried it, uh, uh, nailing jello to the walls and exercise and futility. And this can be at times, but the cap became our tool by which the community could hold the government accountable and we could uh, exercise our, our representatives in Congress to help back us to get things done. And without the cap, we would not have been able to do probably three-fourths of the work that we, we accomplished with Camp Lejeune. And that's an important fact that people need to understand. 
but also consider the longevity. It took, you know, our first victory did not occur in the cap until 2009. And so we had three years of meetings and no real movement until 2009. It was April, 2009 when, when we, we got that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the, uh, you know, the cap is probably one of the single most important events of, um, of this fight. And the fact that um, I think Jerry talked about it, um, and he knows more because he was involved, but the cap uh, came into existence because of Congressman John Dingle. And uh, he's the one that organized it and um, had ATSDR form it. And uh, even the scientists at ATSDR complement the work that we've been able to do. And we're trying to figure out how they could replicate it for other communities, because technically this should happen at every contamination site, but we're the only ones pretty much that had an effective cap. So um, where, where do you want to start? <laughs> I know I kind of, that's a long intro. But well, you, you, you just mentioned something about April, 2009. So we'll go into that, whatever you yeah. want to. And then, you know, the main thing I want to just make sure and get to um, is the water modeling. Uh, okay. Yeah, know. the water modeling is critical. As a matter of fact, the first water model w uh, was issued in June of 2007, and that was a water model for Terra Terra. What is, so, what exactly is a water? What is a water model? Like, let, okay. let's let's back up for people who, uh, you know, there might be attorneys who are coming into this who don't have an environmental background in litigation or that type of thing. So, what are what exactly is a water model? Okay. Well, and, and for purposes of like litigation and stuff, I mean, this, this is going to be critical. And, you know, one of my jobs as a claims adjuster is I spend a lot of time defending uh, litigation, you know, like dog bites and people getting hurt at the house or trip and falls and stuff like that. So I have enough knowledge to be dangerous, but I'm not an attorney and I didn't sleep in a Holiday Inn last night either. But uh, a water model, um, one of the problems that we had at Lejeune is... Um, the, the we have limited data as far as what was in the water now thankfully you have jennings lab you have granger lab you have the army lab all did testing in the water starting in 1980 at various times that documented the presence of contamination but we don't have monthly samples we don't have daily samples we don't even have really yearly samples of the water before then and in order for the scientists to do health effects and for epidemiologists such as Dr. Clapp, Dr. Cantor, Dr. Bovey, to do their health assessments, they have to know what, what you were exposed to and at what levels, because it makes a difference. So um, what, ha what they did is they wanted to go back in order to complete the studies, they had to complete a water model. And just like, you know, like as a kid, if you put together a, a model of a tank or a B-17 bomber, um, you're not putting together the whole thing it's just not possible. So you put together a smaller piece of it that looks and behaves like the real thing, but it's a, it's a, a replica of reality. And the water model essentially was a replica of the, uh, in this case, the Terra Terra system. And it was created in order to help the scientists at ATSDR do their assessments on the health for the children, the babies and the service personnel who lived in that area that were exposed to those contaminants. Another reason why they had to do the water model is because, um, and this became a problem during the water model, um, the log books showing when the Navy operated wells and what wells when, because the, what would happen is the operators would go out and turn on wells and they'd run the wells and pull that water into the system. Well, each well had a building and each building in there had a book of when they came in turned on the well, how long it ran, about how many, you know, they had estimated how many gallons they, they pulled, produced out of the well, and when they closed the well. Well, the log books for the Terra Terra system, the Hadnut Point system, the Holcomb Bowler system, which were the, the big ones for contamination, all mysteriously disappeared. Um, they were not to be found. Uh, now, I say that because I, I have a couple log books from the um, New River system that were given to me by one of the water treatment operators who found them in the trash. And then I think he said in the nineties and, but yet the, the critical log books for the systems that were contaminated were missing. So without those, they, they don't know which, you know, we know what wells were contaminated, but we didn't know how they're operating, you know, like where some wells being operated more than others, how much water was pulling out of those wells. Cause each well had a different um, production rate and what have you. 
So when you talk about water model, what the task they had was daunting. And what Morris had to do is he had to identify each of the wells um, for those systems, what the production rates for those wells were. Um, and they had to model that too, and then put this together with the ground flow of where the contaminants were flowing in the ground with the, with the water table and produce a viable working model that showed how much water was being pulled out of the ground, put into the water treatment plant and distributed and what the dosage per month was for each, you know, for each month, each, each year, the contamination period. And in the case of Terra Terrace, they went back to 1953 and ran their water model uh, showing the contamination points from 1953 to 1987, which is a monumental task. Um, the, uh, and the government paid for all this. Um, if, to give you an idea, if we didn't have this water model and we were going to go to court and try to argue our cases in court, each of our attorneys would have to hire an engineer to do what Morris did. And you're talking, I think the over, and, 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 and I'm, I've heard this number, but I don't remember where it came from, but I think it ended up costing like $14 million. And um, the, uh, and that's both the Terra Terrace and had that point system. Don't quote me on that, but I, and that's a number that's somewhere back in my head that keeps popping up. But think about it, if, if these attorneys had to, pour out 13, $14 million, even $5 million to- If they could find an engineer like Yeah, Morris. if they could I find mean, the engineer to, to do the testing and everything. And then they had to get, they'll have to work with the Marine Corps, get on the base, do all the testing. Uh, and not to mention that it took um, the better part of what, five, six years um, to get all this done. Because uh, I think it took from 2005, 2007 for Terra Terrace. And then when they did the other one, the other water model didn't come out to 2014 for had that point in the Holcomb Boulevard. So you're talking about at least a seven year period to get these water models done. Um, you couldn't take your case to trial without a water model. So if we had to start from scratch today, it'd probably be seven years before they could even take a case to trial. So that's, that's one thing is the time that it saves because it's already done. And also the money. There is no way that a, a, these law firms could take on the financial um, burden of having to produce these water models and take these cases to court. It would be cost prohibitive. So that's the other big thing with the water model is the fact that the government, which you know in this case is the defendant, so it's going to be kind of hard to argue. Well, you know, why would the government, you know, say something that would hurt itself? Well their scientists are the one that did this report and they did it with the objectivity of being the government and verify that we were poisoned and when and how much and how bad. So without the water model, um, the legal issue of what we're trying to fight right now, in my opinion, would be dead. So that's how critical this water model is. And, and the uh, Janie Ensminger law as well, that got yeah. veterans health care and disability presumptions and all of that it, nothing would be i don't i don't believe that anything would be in place without well without there that. might be something i mean because you got like agent orange and you got other contamination events that you got legislation passed without water models it's just that camp lejeune is so complex and so big and you know like i mentioned the base is 236 square miles and the contamination points there are dump sites all over the base and you got the wells are located different various areas of the base and you've got to hydro hydro i can never say this word hydro hydraulically yeah um show where this water is flowing how it's getting into the wells how it's coalescing where, where's the where's the contamination going because you have one thing called a cone of depression so when you turn on a well and you start pumping from that well it influences the aquifer around it and just like a drain it sucks in contamination. So a contamination point may be 30 yards away. And then when you operate that well, 50 times in two weeks, you've just moved that contamination plume closer to the wellhead. And eventually over time, it's going to get into the wellhead. And those are things that Morse did. And if you look through, um, I still have some of the books, like here's one of the books from the water model for the head down point system, chapter A. Um, they're online now, by the way, but these books detail um, the process by which he did it. Uh, they detail the information that he got uh, and they detail the fate and transport of the contamination plumes. This is work that's invaluable. You cannot, uh, there's just no description of how complex this is. Um, there's another part of the water model that I haven't touched. I want to get into real quick. That is a huge part for what we did. Uh, when they, when the, 
when you have a Superfund site such as Camp Lejeune, and this applies to any of the military bases that are Superfund sites, your local, you know, chemical uh, plant that was dumping is a Superfund site. One of the requirements of CERCLA law is that there is a administrative record for that place that is designated as a national priority list or Superfund that remains for 50 years. And typically what they do is they uh, deposit the records in a filing cabinet, usually at the, at the county library where the contamination site is. In this case, for Camp Lejeune, it's the Onslow uh, County Library. And if you go in there, there is a filing cabinet for Camp Lejeune and all the EPA circular documents that are in there. Um, that it, The purpose of that in 1980, when the law was passed, you know, keep in mind, this is pre-internet, and the internet back in 1980 was your library. That's where you went to find information. So the thought was with Congress is we'll require these documents to be deposited where the public can access them. So people like you, people like me, we can go to the library and pull out and see what they're doing to make sure there's sunshine being shined on all the stuff that's going on and that the public understands what is really going on behind the scenes. The problem with that is, as you know, with the library, first of all, things get moved around. Um, it's, you know, you've got three cabinets of documents. Where do you start? How do you search? Um, you know, I remember as a kid, I go in the library after an hour, I was itching to get outside and didn't want to be there. You got to sit at a table and just do research the old fashioned way, pull out a piece of paper, read it, document it, write your notes, put it back and go to the next one. The reason why I'm building all this up is because when Morris Masley did the water model for Terra Terrace, which the books are in, underneath my computer right now, so I can't pull it out. But uh, the um, on the back of the book, there's a set of DVD ROMs and it's read only material. And on those DVD ROMs, because, uh, you know, anything scientific, the purpose of doing it is so that you can replicate what you've done so other scientists can see and test your theories and work on it and everything. So you gotta be able to produce all your references. Where did you get the material? Where did you get the information? On those DVD ROMs, there's three of them. There are all the CLW documents, or at least most of them. There's some that weren't on there that we found later. And then all the circular documents that have been scanned by the government, you're talking hundreds of thousands of pages of documents that are scanned into a digital format. And this is the critical part. You could take that DVD-ROM, pop it in your computer, bring up the library, and then pull up a document and you can search it. Had not point fuel farm and you get, oh, the had not point fuel farm appears on all these documents. And you can go through and look at them and read them. And it, it, for me as like an historian, it, it's a gold mine. And that's what happened. Um, because and as a one, journalist, it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's a gold mine of information. And with information, you have power, like Alexander Pope used to say, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword. Um, so when those DVDs were released, which is when I was diagnosed and got involved in this, I got myself a set and I started going through it. And I talked to Jerry and said, Jerry, you know, do we have a timeline? And he said, no, we don't. I said, well, the Marine Corps has got several timelines. Have we put one together? And, and I remember I kind of at the time was like, oh, crap. But he goes, that's a great idea, Partain. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he goes, no, get it done. And uh, and I started working on Be it. Be careful what you say around yeah, here. Yeah, careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but in all kidding aside, you know, the, the work that Major Tom did, the DVD library and everything that we put together, became a critical point with the community because before then we had Jerry and Tom going up to, uh, uh, well, Tom providing the documents and everything and Jerry going to Washington, but there was nothing concrete that you could put your hands on. And that's what the timeline is. The timeline, we, we found it a home on the website, the few, the proud, the forgotten. It's uh, hyperlinked. So all the documents that we reference in the timeline, you click it, it brings up that documents you can read because we uploaded all these documents from that DVD ROM are part of the few of the proud the forgotten website. So And that's that's uh T T T F T P T F dot com. Tango Frank Tango Frank dot com. But and also just to say I printed that timeline out 
and I've used it as my, you know, one of my kind of Bibles. Um, I have it in a binder. So um, I just want to reiterate to people who need to research this, Mike's timeline is essential. Essential. Yeah. I mean, the, and this is, you know, going back to the water model, this is one of the unintended consequences of, of the water model. I mean, the water model was supposed to help the scientists do their research for the health effects. But what it did, what it did is it galvanized the community and it gave us a tool that we were able to put together that, you know, because what happened was once we got the timeline done, it took me about eight months to write it. Uh, and I mean, I would spend, I'd spend pretty much all my free time from nine o'clock at night to three in the morning, sometimes on the phone with Jerry and going through these documents and trying to put them all together. And I remember when we released the timeline, which was July of 2008 at a cap meeting, and one of the uh, Marine Corps representatives, Lieutenant Colonel Tenkate, Michael Tenkate, who was in the Dan Rather interview with Jerry um, uh, 2009. Anyways, Lieutenant Ken Colonel Tenkate, uh, we were talking and challenging the Marine Corps about notification at this cap meeting. And he's all we notified people. And I said, really? And I pulled the timeline out and I said, oh, according to the base environmental engineer, Robert Alexander in September, 1985, Raleigh Observer, um, entry on my timeline, um, you were telling people that uh, they weren't directly exposed to the pollutants. And he got real quiet and we had a break shortly after that. And I'll never forget this because I'm sitting there at the, at the table for the cap meeting and I'm getting ready to go up to go to the bathroom. And before I could get up from the table, because um, I'd shut my computer and, and put my stuff away, before I could rise up from the table, Lieutenant Colonel Tenkate was sitting on my side and he was, where'd you get that from? Where'd you, know, where'd you get this information from? And I'm looking at him and I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, your timeline, how'd you, where'd you get all this information? And I said, well, you know, I, sir, I put this together through research and everything as well. You're not gonna find any smoking guns in there. And that's the part I'll never forget. And I look back and I said, well, Colonel, I said, I might not find the uh, smoking guns, but I can tell where they are and what they should be by the timeline. And that's what, what happened. I mean, we, when Jerry and I went to Congress, we took the timeline with us. At first it was in paper and then over with the in advances in technology through iPad and iPhones, we had it on the internet and we could show it live in the meeting. So if we're talking to a congressional representative, bring up the timeline, click the document, here's your, here's your proof right here, sir. And that, that was, like I said, it's an unintended consequence of the water model, but a critical one, because without that academic part of it, which is Morris documenting everything that he was doing, how he got the information, where he got it from, and the fact that they required the Marine Corps and Navy to scan these documents in a digital format, we wouldn't be where we're at today, because there was no way that I could take the time, because it took a lot of time as it was, for me to drive from Tallahassee, Florida, where I lived at the time, to Jacksonville, North Carolina, to spend an hour and two in the library pulling documents. It, it just wouldn't have happened. And we would still be doing it and we would never get it done. So that part I can't emphasize enough, that the advancement in digital technology and the fact that Morris was thorough in that regard and then got these documents scanned and in a searchable format so we could use them it, it gave voice to the community that we would not have had. So those are the two big things with the, with the water model. Now, um, when you talk about the cap, I mean, 2007, 2008, we're getting geared up. I'm getting geared up and, um, and, you know, Jerry's fighting and going to Congress and everything. And through the research, one of the questions that we kept, I kept coming across that um, bothered me was benzene. Because when you look at the 1997 public health assessment for Camp Lejeune, um, they're talking about chlorinated solvents, but they're not talking about benzene. And benzene comes from fuel. It's one of the um, constituents of fuel. We knew at the time that the Marine Corps and the Navy had lost about 30,000 gallons of fuel at the Hadnot Point fuel farm, which is a lot of fuel. You think about it, it's what six tanker trucks of, of fuel that they lost. And we knew that through the documents because there's uh, there's a big fuel sp spill in 1979 where they lost, I think, 20, 30,000 gallons in itself. And then there's fuel spills mentioned throughout the IAS report talking about how over the years they lost fuel. And we, you know, but there's no fuel in the drinking water. Now, 
Morris and the scientists at ATS there are saying, well, fuel floats. That's why it's not it's not showing up. And they they had, now keep in mind while we're asking these questions, they had not completed the the water model for the had not point uh, system because that was the bigger one, more complex one, and they were working on it. But with the public health assessment, there um, in the correct what I was saying, the public health assessment said there was no exposure to fuel, and what we got from the leadership at ATSDR is that there's no evidence of fuel in the drinking water. And of course, Morris is working on that through the water model, which eventually does show that there is fuel in the drinking water, but that we don't get that answer until 2014. Anyways, in 2009, um, what had happened was, and we're, we're that, this is a critical point, um, we were bringing up the issue of fuel quite regularly at the CAP meetings. And if you go back and look at the transcripts, you'll see us talking about fuel. And what about fuel? And, um, you know, we keep getting the same answer. There's there's no evidence of fuel. There's no evidence of fuel. And when we're going through the documents, um, what ended up happening was there was a like one document that was a, uh, a interim report from the contractor who was doing the confirmation study of board camp Le Gym. And in July of 1984, they pull a water sample from well 602, which is one of the um, production wells on the Hadnot Point. And that sample comes back contaminated with benzene, which is huge because in November 1984, there's like a big black hole in the documents. You go from July 1984 to November 1984, and there are virtually no documents. It's like they, uh, they were all sucked up into space and they disappeared. In November 1984, they start closing wells down. They just it just appears and they close well down, but they're not sampling for benzene. And well 602 is one of these wells that they closed down. So this July 1984 sample that shows that they sampled from a active well that was producing uh, water for the water system um, live comes back hot for benzene. What that means is that there's benzene in the water that we're drinking. So we take this and along with, at the same time, we didn't know it, but the scientists at ATSDR had um, uh, stumbled upon an, a password protected portal, which had uh, the Navy's UST program, um, which is underground storage tank program. They had gotten access to that, which had details of leaks in the, in the fuel farm, which were far greater than we could ever imagine. So the long story short is Jerry takes the evidence that we found through the documents um, and he runs it to Congress and he runs it to the director of ATSDR and he says, here we go again. And he points out, here's the document, here's the well, it's hot with benzene. Now to understand this, the prior to this event, all the wells that sh did show benzene were tested after that well was taken offline. So that's where the government was saying there's no evidence that there was benzene in the water. So we had the evidence. And what happened was in April 2009, this all came to a head and we challenged it. And we asked the director of ATSDR to withdraw the public health assessment for Camp Lejeune. Because uh, to kind of explain what that is, a public health assessment is a document that's created by ATSDR for every Superfund site like Camp Lejeune. And it assesses what you were exposed to and potential health effects. Benzene wasn't included in it. And the fact that we found benzene in the water while the wells were running meant that the public health assessment was incomplete. So they withdrew the public health assessment for Camp Lejeune. That had never happened in the operational history of ATSDR since 1980. So um, that was a huge victory for the community. Ultimately became important because it's it, that victory kept us alive when the NRC report came out a few months later. Um, because the NRC report um, basically was a government hack study, for lack of a better word. And that's that, National Research Council, Yeah, right? National Research Council. I mean, there's a whole, we can go into all kinds of pig trails with that. But the, basically, the report said that you were exposed. Um, we can't really prove what it did to you. Don't bother doing any more. And just, you know, this needs to go away. And uh, later on, we found out that the the government had actually contracted with the NRC to um, uh, signed a contract a month before the report was released to defend the report against any critics. And they paid them like, I think it was $600,000. And, and, and if I can just interrupt uh, right here and say, 
if you are a veteran and your disability claim or your, you know, health care, anything like that, if someone's challenging you, make sure and make get their sources, get their documents, because that NRC report, they kept using it beyond when they were supposed to, because that was dismissed. And, and so people need to make sure that, that it, you know, if they're going to court, that, that the uh, the government isn't trying to use that NRC report, for instance. Yeah, and uh, and it's actually still being used uh, by by the VA to help defend against Camp Lejeune claims. But going back to our story here, the um, with the public health assessment being uh, revoked for Camp Lejeune, that meant that they had to go back and reevaluate it, and it was it it really gave the cap uh, a huge amount of um, credibility because. You know, we didn't do that by just dancing around and walking around in circles and, and yelling and screaming. It was a lot of hard work. It was research, we documenting, um, going to Congress, meeting with congressional officials. Um, I can't, I mean, it, it, it took a lot of hard work to get to that point to where we could challenge and be effective. Because before, you know, we challenged, but they would just say, go away. You know, uh, there's nothing to see here and you don't have proof. So um, that that was probably the the first and most important victory um, of our fight with the cap, and like I said earlier, without the cap, we wouldn't have been able to do that uh, to accomplish the work that um, to led to that. So when you talk about Warner model, we we spent a lot of time talking about Terra Terrace. Um, after the Terra Terrace system was water modeled. Um, in order to do the, the epidemiological studies, they had to complete the water model for Headnot Point and Holcomb Boulevard, which is the other side of the base. And that's where the bulk of the personnel were exposed. But the problem with that is it was the most, um, it, it, it's huge compared to Terra Terrace. You got one or two neighborhoods in Terra Terrace. On main side, you've got main side, you've got all the barracks, you've got all the industrial area, you've got Holcomb Boulevard, and then all the other family housings around, including the Naval Hospital too. And it's the it's probably what I would guess about eighty percent of the population of the base, as a guess, uh, would be in that area. And they had to water model that, and it, it was much more complex. Um, so Morris um, under you know started uh, that undertaking almost immediately. And um, one of the things about it, and another importance of the cap is. When the NRC report came out, um, the Department of the Navy tried to withhold funding to pay for these studies. Because one of the beauties of CERCLA is that the polluter has to pay for these studies because someone has to pay the bill. And the polluter in this case was the Department of Defense. So all the work that Morris was doing, that millions of dollars that I mentioned earlier, um, that had to be paid by the Department of the Navy. Well, the Navy said, well, based on the NRC report, we don't, you know, this is pointless and we shouldn't study it. We're not going to pay for it anymore. And they actually stopped funding the work. And ATSDR was starting to run out of money. And, you know, we found out what was going on. So Jerry and I went to Congress and we, you know, drove up there. And, uh, you know, I drive up from Florida, Tallahassee to his house and ride with him up to Washington, D.C., and we met with Senator Burr, Senator Hagan's office, Senator Nelson, um, and, you know, and at times Senator Rubio and everything and trying to get this, um, trying to get the funding uh, done. And Jerry went back uh, on his own a couple of times. And what ended up happening was Senator Burr um, blocked um, promotions and uh, hiring from at the senior grade level uh, for the Department of the Navy. And um, what he does, uh, I forgot the term for it, but he, he hung a, a chip on his cloak, uh, racks, basic saying that he was going to object and they couldn't move forward with any nominations for promotions, like for Admiral and what have you, or any hiring for um, senior levels in the Department of the Navy. And within like three days, the Department of the Navy relented and provided funding back to ATSDR. And that shows That'll you, do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that shows you, the, I mean, without the credibility of the cap, and the credibility of the work and the the documentation that we did and were able to put together, that wouldn't have happened. If it had just been us saying, you know, calling up there saying, you know, uh, you need to fund us, you should, you know, a, a thousand people call saying you need to fund it, that, that type of political pressure would not have worked. What worked was the facts and the story that we put together and being able to wield that as 
uh, a political tool to force the government to keep doing what it was supposed to do. And this battle, by the way, we fought several times because throughout the, from 2009 to 2014, at almost every opportunity, there was an excuse the Navy would balk at trying to pay or fund uh, the, the water model studies. And we would have to go to Congress and make sure that this, our senators were on board to make sure that uh, the Department of the Navy came through with the funding. And ultimately in 2014, um, the, uh, the water model for had that point came out. There's another critical part, and this is that, that water model I was telling you about. Another critical part of this water model uh, is, uh, is another game that was being played behind the scenes is legislatively, uh, Jerry had inserted into the NDAA a requirement that the Department of the Navy notify the people exposed to uh, contaminants when the water models were complete. So in 2007, um, letters went out to the people living in Terra Terrace stating that you and your family were exposed to contaminated water and we completed research, blah, blah, blah. Well, if the water model was not complete, then that legislative requirement would not happen. So that was another incentive for the Navy to, to see that it didn't finish the had not point system. Because like I said, roughly 80% of the population that exposed aboard the base was on aboard had not point. So once that water model was complete for had not point, the letters went out for the families and the service personnel that were exposed there. They didn't get everybody, but you know, at least that started. And I keep hearing even today, oh, I first found out when I got a letter from the Department of the Navy saying that I'd been exposed. Uh, I think it came from the IRS or something like that. But um, uh, Jerry has the details on that. But uh, the, uh, the the funny part is like, yeah, it, that was us. It took an act of Congress to make them do that. And um, I'll never forget uh, General Payne was being interviewed by Michelle Gillen, I think in 2011 and everything, but, um, and it was about the terror terror system at the time, but, um, you know, he said he was making the claim that, oh, we notified people and we told people, and she goes, well, why did it take an act of Congress to make, you know, make you guys contact the families and tell them that they've been exposed? And it, so that, it, that's the other part it, of the Yeah. So yeah, the water model yeah. itself with Morris, I mean, as we get into the court case, it's going to be critical. Um, for what Morris has, because, um, you know, he is the expert, he put this together and the government, you know, this is the government studying the defendant in the case, did all the legwork and showed the contamination. And you can go look in these models and you can look at the month and year that you were there and see what you were being dosed with on a monthly basis, which is right. huge. It's another resource that I don't think people realize they have. Yeah. And this leads me into the studies, you know, once you get beyond the water modeling, then we have all of the studies that were completed at ATSDR, the health study. Yeah. And well, without again, the water model, there's no, there's no male breast right. cancer study, which ATSDR did. There's no um, uh, mortality study that they did on both the base employees and the um, service person off in 1975 to 1985. That's not possible. The current cancer incident study, which is due out hopefully the next year or two, that wouldn't be possible without the water model. So that's why another reason why these this water model is so critical, because without it, it's the basic foundation for all these scientific um, epidemiological studies that are being done at Camp Lejeune. Right. And and the those studies, the epidemiology, I'm having trouble now, like you were earlier, epidemiological studies, um, those are paid for by the defendant, if you want to use terminology for a trial. So, you know, I would really, you know, just remind people that, um, and or, or tell people for the first time that they probably don't realize that it's going to be very difficult for the government to say that study, I'm sorry, you, you know, I don't, we don't trust that study. Well, you paid for it. It's your people. You did the and you study. Did it. <laughs> That's the thing is you did the study, not us. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a water model expert that my attorney hired. It was your water model expert. So you're going to say that they're not good. I mean, that's convenient. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's, I think it's important um, because as you said, that, you know, there's, there's a, uh, there seems to be a school of thought that the Navy is not going to challenge the kind of facts of the case w that are people were poisoned, but uh, you know, uh, if they're going to fight this and I'll tell you, I right think now, they're going to fight it too. And that's, you know, maybe it's our experience and our, 
yeah, I think it's, I think maybe it's our war wound, so to speak, with the Navy already that makes us think that they're never going to just say, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll accept that as established fact. I think that, each, you know, so uh, I think that is why I really wanted to get this out, um, this interview with you and, and, and explain to people that, that when the Navy, when the Department of Justice, JAG, when, you know, when they, they have these things to say, well, look first at the things they've already said. Right. You know, you, you don't don't think you might have to come up with something new to counteract it. Just look at what they've said already. You can search those cap transcripts. You can search it for um, leukemia and benzene. Benzene is a known carcinogen that is known to cause leukemia, which my mother died of two types of. So, you know, don't think you've got to start from scratch here. We've done a lot of work. And this work, I, I believe, will be critical in these lawsuits. And I, I think that, um, it, you know, we wouldn't do it for lawsuits. I, 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 we never talked about lawsuits in this work. In fact, we, I think we pretty much tried to keep any kind of legal stuff out of the room, so to speak, in the community assistance panel, because it, it wasn't ever about for us. It was about getting to the truth. But now it's there, you know. Uh, and, and, and I think our approach of trying to, to get to the truth is, is what is going to give a lot of credibility to people who are trying to get some sort of justice for their loss and their pain and suffering. Yeah, they're putting kind of in layman's term a point that you brought up. You know, when you talk about the defendant, okay, just imagine, you know, you have a family, the husband's on trial for murder. And, you know, the wife, his wife is there and she's a witness. Okay. The family, when you say the defendant here is the government. Okay. And within that family, you have department of defense, you have the CDC, you have ATS, they are all part of this big family and who's on trial right now. It's the department of defense. And when you put Morris on the stand, he is part of the government. And he is working for an agency that's part of the government. So it's kind of like the wife saying, oh, yeah, I saw him walking around with a gun today. <laughs> and uh, it, it's not good for the government because it's they're all one and they're all part of the same entity. And for the ATSDR to come out and say, yes, here's the contamination. Yes, the water was poisoned. Yes, it was poisoned at this level at this month over this many years. It's going to be hard for them to refute that because it's the government talking to itself and that's a it's a powerful thing and uh i can't wait to see there's a that. study on birth defects yeah. birth defects there's a study you know so and and we have studies coming up on several things um so you know and all of this is available on the atsdr website um again the best way to get to it is just atsdr and camp lejeune and google that i've noticed it's funny because my one of my articles in the Pacific Standard Magazine used to come up first when you Googled Camp Lejeune. I had that, you know, tragic honor, I guess, for a while, but now it's all attorney stuff. So, um, but make sure you're on the, the official ATSDR website, which is a, a part of the CDC, so that you can um, access all of this, this information. Uh, and, and also, I want to plug our Facebook group because we have. Um, there's multiple Facebook groups, um, but the, the one that has the most members is the one that you've managed and cared for all these years, um, which, you know, I help with. But um, again, you're, you're the person who gets the credit for it. And there's over 20,000 members now. And uh, do you want to tell people how they get to that in case they have follow up? Yeah, questions? There's, there's actually two sites for the information. The first site was like the, and still is. Um, unfortunately, it was hacked and. I'm going to try to get it rebuilt over the next couple of months, but uh, it's up and running, but it's a shell of what it used to be. That site's called The Few, The Proud, The Forgotten. That's where you find the timeline and you can actually go into the document library that's still working and you can pull the documents that are in the timeline and read them for yourselves. Uh, and that's the beauty of the timeline. Now, the other social media site, which is at the time when, you know, The Few, The Proud, The Forgotten was the primary site for a long time. And around 2009, social media really kicked off and Facebook 
and I started uh, Camp Lejeune Toxic Water Survivors. Now I'll say this because, um, you know, like with social media, you got to be careful. And there are two toxic water, Camp Lejeune Toxic Water Survivors site. Um, you'll know mine because there's a Newsweek article uh, of a Marine in dress blues saluting with a, um, a mask on his face. Um, that's an actual Newsweek article that uh, we got out. In it was the cover. It was yeah, the it was cover, cover of Newsweek. Uh, and I actually found found my copy of it the other day when I was going through my stuff. But um, yeah, anyways, that is, the, that is the legitimate site. And the other way you can tell is just 20,000 people on it. The, the the ghost site that I don't know why it's up there, but because uh, they won't let me in, they blocked me from it. But um, uh, it's, uh, I think, like 2,000 people. But that Camp Lejeune Toxic Water Survivor site is on Facebook. It's an important site. Uh, it's a rally point. Um, I'd rather have a discussion board than what we have with social media because uh, rumors can get started. Like over the weekend, someone tried to say that they had their case in front of a judge, um, which is not true. And um, it, it started, uh, you know, a, a crap show on social media. But trying, you know, we're trying to get information out through that site. Um, I know that uh, you're active on it, and and um, I appreciate your help with that. But um, you know, if if you want to get more information, come to the Facebook site. Our fight is not over; it, it's still ongoing. Um, by the way, I mean the cap still meets, and there is another shoe that is going to drop that. Uh, we haven't talked about, but this is upcoming in 2023. Um, we've heard around July, August, uh, it should come out. But a lot of people, we've had people come to us saying, hey, I've got multiple myeloma or I've got leukemia, but I was at the base in 1988, 1989. And we're like, well, the drinking water was not contaminated then. Well, I have this disease. And what we found out is this, by the way, and I, I actually didn't get to it, but the, the fuel plume that we talked about earlier that um, was told to be 30,000 gallons and actually we got Senator Burr to write a, uh, and Hagan to write a request for information and the Marine Corps came back and said, according to our records, there was 30 to 50,000 gallons of fuel lost at the Head Not Point fuel farm, which was a true statement because according to the records, that's what they lost. What they didn't tell us is that the fuel farm had been leaking like a sieve and according to the documents their contractors had, the fuel farm had lost 1.5 million gallons of fuel into the aquifer. Now, that fuel plume is still there. And um, it's, you know, fuel is a floater, so it's up at the, at the top end of the aquifer. And the buildings that this fuel gets under, what happens is the fuel vaporizes into the building. And we found documents as we started looking and people were coming to, to Jerry and I saying that, hey, we've got leukemia, we're here in 88. And the 1100 series building is specifically building 1100. We found records that uh, between 1988 and 1999, that there were incidents of fuel vapors in the building that were making people sick and they had to evacuate the building. It got so bad in 1999 that they basically evacuated the entire building. They put uh, sniffers in there to detect benzene and the, the sniffers pegged out at the, at the maximum level. And they, they found that the fuel vapors were so thick in the building that it was at uh, pretty much at the explosive point to where if you strike a match, boom. So um, what we found out is that the fuel plume on Head Not Point was underneath a bunch of buildings and getting into these buildings and they had to do, the ATSDR launched what's called a vapor intrusion study. That report is due out this year. And we're, we're waiting for it to come out because what that's going to do is that's going to open the door for other contamination pathways for the personnel working on the Hadnot Point industrial area, um, which we know that there are people sick and people have died. Uh, there's one Major Tomlin, she worked in this building and she died of multiple myeloma, which is a benzene caused cancer. Well, now we know why. So the ATA, uh, the uh, CAP is still active. We're still meeting and um, we're still working on studies. And if we're right about the study, when it does come out, we're going to have to go back to Congress and ask for an extension on the um, Camp Lejeune Justice Act, because that means there's going to be exposures that go into the 1990s. And the Janie Ensminger Act as well, right? Yes, that too. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was the first law we got passed in 2012 was Janie Ensminger Act. So I mean, we um, can talk all day. There's all kinds of <laughs> pictures yeah. go down on this. 
no, I was about to say, you know, I'd love to have you back um, to talk yeah. about, you know, we've talked about the kind of the root of the cap, but, but, with, but we also do, um, we help with the VA and that's a whole other story. So maybe you'll come back sometime and we'll just do a whole yeah. well, I'd love session to, on uh, the VA. I would love to come back several times. One of the things I would love to sit down and do, um, and we'd have to talk to Rebecca and see if we can do this or not. I would like to go through and pull the key documents that show what they knew, when they knew it, and what they did and what they didn't do, and have these documents up on the screen and talk about them. Uh, because yeah. there's nothing more powerful than when you pull up the March 1981 Army Lab report. It says that your water is highly contaminated, and they put the word solvents with an exclamation point in parentheses. I mean, it's no, like I, just you're, screaming at you. you're, yeah, you're so right because. Um, you know, it's hard. It's hard even like, as you said earlier, sometimes certain things just kind of get in your throat when you're preparing to talk about it. But uh, I was going through my mom's stuff after she died and I found one of my school photos from my school at Tora Terrace and um, I turned it over and it said October 1980. And wow. that is the exact month. As you yeah, know, they pulled the first uh, sample October 1st, and then the second sample, uh, which is the first Army lab report, came in August 30th. I mean, uh, sorry, October 30th. Right. And uh, so, so that yeah. that visual to me was like, God, you were a little girl when they they knew that your water was poison. So, um, no, I we we can certainly look into that, and we'll we'll do a we'll hopefully do some work on the the subject matter experts and the, the, that whole program with the VA and the difference between disabilities uh, and, and healthcare, all of that stuff. So, you know, I really appreciate your time. Um, I appreciate well, are, uh, legal cast I'm letting us do this and go so long. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> one of the things I'm looking forward to in this, when we talk about it and I'll, I'll shut up here so you can wrap up. Um, you know, I, I testified in 2010 against the Marine Corps and it was a history battle of what narrative of what happened on the Camp Lejeune contamination was going to be believed. Um, you know, I, I've, I've spent 15 years of my life fighting this and working with you, Jerry, and others, but I, I relish the opportunity to sit down and, and, you know, Jerry and I are the historical experts on what happened at Camp Lejeune. We know what happened. We've got the continuity. We've got the evidence. I want to get into discovery and get all the documents that we haven't been able to find, the ones that were redacted that we can see unredacted, and put this narrative together and, and hold their feet to the fire. Uh, I'm looking forward to that, and I want to see that happen um, because I, I don't think there's um, – Anyone in anyone else in the community that can sit down and do that, and you know, and our venue is going to be the courtroom, and I, I, I want to testify. I want to be, you know, I want to be on the stand to sit there and go toe to toe with the representatives of the Marine Corps about what really happened in Bord Lejeune, because I want that story out. Me too, and um, I, and you know, I, I hope we, we, we see that day. Uh, uh, you and I and Jerry, um, you know. I would like to, I, as I said to Jerry on the phone a couple of days ago, um, whatever I have to do to be in the courtroom when Jerry is on the stand, I will be there because uh, this is something that we've worked very hard for. And um, and and you you and I, by the way, uh, are with different law firms. We're both happy with our law firms, and and I believe they're both very good firms, but. We are here for all the law firms, and you know, as far as we have these kind of dual roles. I'm a journalist, but I'm you know part of this community. So we, you know, we are here to raise. We want to we want to uh, raise the tide that will lift all boats, and and so you know, we 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 want to help all the law firms put on the best case they can for their clients, and um and and. I think that hopefully we're hopefully we're we're putting down a lot of good information that they can reach. Yeah, one of my fears in this, I mean, these the when you talk about the law firms, um, and we you know we see this on the site and stuff like that. But one of my greatest fears is that one of these law firms is going to go into this half cocked, not knowing what they're talking about, and they're going to damage everybody in the effort. So you know, it's important that. Um, we get our story straight and get it right. And the information's there and correct because this is not going to be a rollover. Here's your check. Uh, it may be for certain people aboard the base at certain times, 
But even then, I think that will be a dogfight over um, what the true value of your claim is. Um, so this is not going to be an easy resolution. And I will caution anyone who's listening here, uh, anyone that says, oh, this is going to be over by next year or even two years from now. It's going to be, in my opinion, probably two, four year, two to four years before we really start to see it. Uh, I know Michael, my attorney, had mentioned in a Facebook live meeting that, you know, they- Who is your attorney? Just to let people know who Michael is. Oh, it's, it's Michael Watts and their, their site is CampLejuneLegal.com. But he did the uh, fires out in California that was started by PG&E. And those fires, I believe, occurred in 2018, 19. And here we are three, four years down the road now. And they're just now getting to the point where they're settling claims. And uh, because they've had to fight and they had to go through all so many loopholes. And these people are now starting to get the money for their claims. So, you know, I tell people just be patient um, and, you know, keep active and just do what you need to do to get your case documented, get your attorney going. And, you know, it's a process and it is going to take time. My understanding, when I talked about the rumor that happened this last weekend over the Facebook page, my understanding is the Navy finally is getting to the point where they can start doing something. And then what they're doing is they're going through and they're verifying the claims that they've received, that that is an actual person and that that claim is accepted and they send a letter to them or their attorney saying that your claim is perfected or um, basically is has been confirmed as being valid it doesn't mean they're being adjudicated or they're being resolved it's just saying hey we got your claim it's here we know you have it and here's your proof that we know you have it uh, and importantly impo yeah. importantly if you haven't gotten that letter please do not worry like it it, it uh, i it's think one time. of the it's going to take time and you're not you're not waiting on that letter to have your case moving forward. Exactly. So, exactly. <laughs> so we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I'll be glad to come back anytime. So thank you for having okay. me. I appreciate it. No, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to the next time, Mike. Okay. Likewise. Take care. You too.